to talk to you about the research sailing trip which I did across the Atlantic last November. So in this talk I'm going to talk about plastic pollution to explain why this was an important research trip to be making. Um, I'll talk about the organization X Expedition um, which I sailed with but then I'll also talk a bit about the adventures and what life on board a sailing boat in the middle of the ocean is like and I will then add end with a call to action as we look to the future and hopefully we'll have some time for questions at the very end. Now, all right, so this is a very happy Yannicka last November, somewhere over the Atlantic. Now, mind you, I am not a sailor by training. I am actually a data scientist. So I'm originally from Malta and I studied mathematics and statistics over there, after which I moved to London to do a PhD in synthetic biology. And then I took on a role as a data scientist with Deloitte. And just this year, the beginning of this year, I moved to the Isle of Wight to take on another role in data, this time with the esteemed Ellen MacArthur Foundation. I don't know if you're familiar with it. If you're not, um, it is a think tank which focusing on, which focuses on transitioning our economic models from their current linear form, where people are buying stuff, using stuff, disposing of stuff, to something which is a bit more circular, something which is a bit more sustainable, where materials are kept in circulation. So yeah, later on, if you do have time, do Google the work that they are doing. So how did this all start to me? How did I decide to become involved in this? Well, this is where I grew up. So. This is five minutes away from, um, uh, from, from, from where I, I lived. So the sea was always a very big part of my identity. I mean, the colors, the sounds, the smell of the sea. But in terms of plastic awareness, that was something I gained much more recently. I think over the past three years, we all probably started seeing more and more articles about plastic pollution and about the impact it's having on the environment, on ourselves as well. And I started trying to understand how I use plastic. So this was one of the kind of experiments, if you can call it that, we did back at home, where for one week we kept all the plastic waste we had, we didn't throw it away. And what you can see uh, is that the majority of that uh, plastic waste is coming from food packaging, and more specifically, single use food packaging. There's then also as well a few bathroom items, but again, the plastic is single use over there. So I also started trying to figure out, okay, how can I play a bigger role in this? How can I make my vo voice heard? Probably because of my data background, I appreciate the power of data to inform government policies, to um, inform the strategies of NGOs, to inform the strategies of business. So when I came across this opportunity, organized by this organization, X Expedition, um, to carry out research about plastic pollution, I knew I had to apply. And it was, mind you, quite a long application process um, over many months, but eventually somehow I got chosen from around 10,000 applicants. And that brings us to last November. Now, the journey I was doing was part of a much bigger project called Round the World, which X Expedition are organizing. So this, um, this project, it is a two-year project. It's a two-year sailing trip in reality all around the world. And it's split up into 30 different legs, 30 different parts. So the one I was doing was from, yeah, the one across the Atlantic. And this two-year project, the Round the World project, is going to see 300 women sail 38,000 nautical miles. The mission remains the same throughout, research ocean plastics. So yeah, the, um, the voyage I did, the leg I did, was the one going from the Azores, which are a Portuguese archipelago, to Antigua in the Caribbean. 
So this was a total of almost 2,300 nautical miles. It also saw us passing through the North Atlantic Garbage Gyre or North Atlantic Garbage Patch. You hear it referred to as different things, but basically this is where there's a massive concentration of waste because of the way the oceanic currents function. And we took 17 um, days to, to sail across this. We had anything from no wind at all, completely still, to 40 plus knots of wind, which is stormy weather, but not too stormy. You're not fearing for your life. We were carrying out scientific studies every day, and I was on board with 13 other women, so 14 in total. And together, we managed to consume 55 packets of business biscuits. Sorry. And just for reference, this is what the receipts of dried goods um, looks like when you're trying to buy food for 14 women for two weeks, plus surplus for another 34 days, just in case. Now, what is the Organization X Expedition? I've been mentioning a few times. So it founded in 2014. It's a not-for-profit organization that has been running all female sailing research trips to investigate the causes of ocean plastic pollution um, and also to investigate the solutions. And mind you, as I mentioned, I was doing leg two of 30 voyages. So X Expedition is still taking applications for the later legs. So if anyone is interested, do check out their website. They're on social media, obviously. And yeah, if you're interested in applying, as I mentioned, you don't need to be a sailor. So do consider that. Now, why is it all women, I hear you ask? Well, easy. Because plastic and the toxic chemicals attached to plastic affect men and women differently. We know that chemicals found in plastics have links to breast cancer, they have links to fertility issues, they have links to hormonal disruptions, and these all affect women. And mind you, these toxic chemicals are found in all sorts of plastic products from toys to shower curtains, to cosmetic products, to menstrual products. I mean, the list goes on and on. But we do need more data. We do need more research into these um, issues. And who better to research this than the women themselves? Plus, X Expedition want to change the, the tired narrative there is around explorers and adventures. Uh, adventures like think of a sailor. Most people would probably think of a man. Um, when I talk to young boys and girls, I just want them to see that they can be whatever they want to be. So okay, what is the problem? I've been mentioning ocean plastic, plastic pollution. What what is the the scale of the problem? Well. Really, the problem is plastic waste. Plastic as a material per se, no, that is not the enemy. That is not what we're trying to eliminate as such. So yeah, as a material, plastic was popular, popular, popularized in the 1960s, and it's completely changed our life. Um, I mean, suddenly we had this cheap, durable, multi-purpose material, which we could use for anything from our cars to our spaceships to medicine and um, packaging construction you name it so what that means is if you look at this chart which shows us um the amount of plastic being produced over the past 60 or so years you can see that we basically went from no tons being produced in the 1950s to what we're probably approaching now the 400 million mar mark um, so 400 million tons of plastic. So yeah, we've completely embraced it. So the problem lies in, as I mentioned, waste. The, prob waste. the problem lies in what happens at the end of life, which is seeing plastic being disposed of incorrectly, it's being mismanaged, and it ends up on beaches like we can see here. So this was a photo I took from a beach clean we did on the Azores before setting sail. And in a matter of 30 minutes, we collected four, I think it was four, yeah, massive sacks of plastic waste. And the sad thing is, if we had gone the next day, we would probably have been able to collect the 
exact same amount of plastic. And if we had gone along anywhere on the English coast, we would probably have been able to do the same. Because the reality is that plastic pollution is a problem worldwide. We've got the equivalent of one rubbish truck a minute being dumped into the ocean. And that adds up to 9 million tons a year of plastic waste entering the system. Now, if these numbers don't really mean anything to you, I mean, for me, it's difficult to understand what 9 million tons really mean. Let me paint a picture another way. So first of all, what I'm sure you all know is that plastic doesn't really disintegrate. It just breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces. And at the point where they are the size of maybe your small fingernail um, or maybe half your small fingernail, they become referred to as microplastics. And really, once you've got that quantity of these tiny particles, it's going to be difficult to control them. And one of the places they end up is the ocean. Another place where they end up is in the food system. So there's been research by um, Reuters which shows that on a monthly basis, we are more or less ingesting 21 grams of plastic, which is the size of a small uh, cereal bowl. Over a year, that adds up to 250 grams. So mainly, you know, size, size of a small steak. And over the course of your lifetime, I mean, congratulations, you have somehow ingested 20 kilograms of plastic, which is the equivalent of one rubbish bin. Now, when it comes to waste, we can see that packaging is by far the prime offender. So it accounts for 42% of waste being generated. And for me, the tragic, frustrating part is that most of this is single use, which means it's got a low product lifetime. So you've invested all that effort getting oil um, out, of the, out of the earth. Producing the, um, producing the packaging, producing the plastic, transporting that so that you then just use it once and throw it away. The other frustrating thing is that this is mostly avoidable. I'm not saying we can eliminate all plastic packaging, but definitely most of it. If we put our minds to it, we can find a host of different solutions to replace it. And Another thing to keep in mind, as again, I'm sure you all know, is that recycling is not the solution. It is just not the answer. Here you can see a study from a few years back. It was carried out in the UK. And what you can see here is the number of throwaway plastic items which a single person collected over a year. So they had around 4,000 plastic, wa um, plastic waste pieces. What you notice here is that of those 4,000 pieces, only 4% were recycled in the UK. Another 6% were exported, supposedly for recycling, but it's difficult to keep track what happens to them once they're exported, while the rest are either burned or landfilled. Now, the other thing to keep in mind, obviously, is that this does not just affect us. This is also affecting wildlife. So newborn fish are mistaking tiny bits of rubbish for food. When it's so small, it's difficult to differentiate. And there are really two options what happens. Either the small fish die, which means larger fish don't find anything to eat, or the larger fish eat the small fish and you have plastic entering the food system. Either way, the food chain is being rattled. Here in this picture, you can see um, it's a baby man of war jellyfish, which we caught in one of our experiments. So, okay, I'm going to now pivot again to talk about the science. So we've spoken about um, plastic pollution. What type of research were we trying to carry out? Well, in short, a lot. We were doing experiments to collect samples from the surface of the ocean, from the subsurface of the ocean, so 30 meters down, and then also from the sediment. And we were carrying out experiments in port, we were carrying experiments out at sea, so we were trying to do a lot. But I'm just going to focus on the experiment which we carried out every single day. This was our most common experiment, ocean surface sampling, where as the name implies, we were trying to look at the type of plastic or, and the quantities of plastic found on the surface of the ocean. 
Now, we use a piece of equipment known called the Mentatrol. It's called the Mentatrol because as you can see here, it looks a bit like a manta ray. So what you've got here at the back, that is a net. So that net lets all the water out, but it collects all sorts of rubbish in, in, in the net. And we were trying to understand three things. The quantity and the amount of plastic we would find the type of plastic we would find, and also the distribution, meaning if we were close to land, or if we were in the middle of the garbage patch, or if we were in the middle of the ocean, what differences would we see um, in, in numbers? Now, after we had done the experiment where you would switch off the engine, uh, put down the sails, and just float, uh, we would float for 30 minutes, um, and that would amount roughly, depending on the wind, to around one nautical mile of distance. So yeah, we would do that experiment for 30 minutes, drag the equipment back on board, um, and then we would pass all the collected material through sieves, which would allow us to wash away any seaweed and throw back into the sea any baby crabs or baby fish or whatever baby jellyfish we were finding, and then pick out the plastic pieces and um, record and keep those plastic pieces. And here is a very common finding um, we were getting. You can see this soup of tiny anonymous plastic pieces, um, which we would keep for further analysis at a later stage. Sometimes we would also find more recognizable pieces like this bottle cap, classic and like this wood and um, this plastic spoon sorry um, and this for me is particularly frustrating because we had found these when we had not seen ships for days we had not seen planes for days we were in the middle of the ocean so how did they end up there what were they doing there for me the scary part was that when you looked out of the ocean this is what you saw you saw this gorgeous, gorgeous, beautiful, deep blue sea. And there were many times when I would say, oh, look at the sea, it looks way too clean. Today, we're definitely not going to find any plastic. But day in, day out, we found lots of plastic pieces. And I mean, a question I'm still trying to answer is, is how, how do you talk about this massive problem? when it's hiding in plain sight. Because this is not just a problem on, you know, sometimes we see pictures of um, those beaches which are covered in plastic. It's not just there, it is everywhere. And how do you convey the state of urgency when our oceans still look like this? So I'm, st I'm still trying to figure out the answer for that. For now, I'm going to talk about something else, about life on board the, um, uh, on board the sailing boat. So first of all, this is the team, the incredible team I was sailing with. So there were 14 of us in total. Uh, three of us were professional sailing crew, and then the rest were women from all walks of life. So we had anything from 22-year-olds to 58-year-olds. We had people from all over the world, Malta, Denmark, US, um, UK, list goes on and on. And again all sorts of uh, careers so we had lawyers we had costume designers we had teachers again a whole range and the expedition do this on purpose they want as many women from as many walks of life as possible to participate so that they can then go back to their own communities and using their own voices and using their own stories they talk about what they've seen so that as a, an informed community, they can then start finding solutions to the problem. Here is a picture I took as we were leaving port. So this was our D-Day and we were super excited, but seasickness quickly set in. And five hours in, this is what I looked like. I look so, so miserable. I mean, now I laugh at it because it's a very funny picture. But yeah, I was so miserable. And you can see um, Natasha, one of my crewmates, resting on my leg as well. She was passed out. Here you can see Luis's legs again passed out with the waves crashing behind us. 
So yeah, wasn't great, but after two days, all of that passed. And then I got to be treated to sites such as this. So when we were on the boat, we weren't just there to do the research. We were expected to participate fully in the upkeep of the boat. And one of those things included night watches. So being woken up at 2 a.m. never gets easy, but you do get treated to these types of skies. And I remember when I took this photo, the moon was so bright, you could read a book. The other thing you then got treated to was the sunrise. And every sunrise was different. And you had this wonderful, weird palette of colors going on. This is the boat. For those, if any of you know anything about sailing, this is, is a Fenty Foot Bermudan Catch. And we were also expected to uh, steer, to helm the boat. So we were taught how to do that. This is something I had never done in my life. So I did it every day. And coming up is another picture which I find very funny. So I am a five foot two Maltese person. And this is all you could see from the front. You would think no one was helming the boat. Another thing is, I mean, unsurprisingly, we didn't have any internet. And let me tell you, this was not a problem at any stage. We spent time together, cooking, eating, talking, sometimes just reading and contemplating in silence next to each other. It was the simple life, and that's how we liked it. Here you can see me maintaining a very basic level of hygiene on the boat. And here you can see me curled up probably enjoying the sunshine while reading, I think. Now food, food was a very big part of our trip. Um, we spent a lot of time discussing what to have for breakfast, what to have for lunch, what to have for dinner, and probably while we were dipping our hands into the biscuit tip, which was fundamental. And one of the other things we had to do is cook for our crewmates. So we were divided into teams and we had to cook. And here you can see my teammate, Luis. I think on that day we were cooking bean chili and potatoes. And what you can also notice is there's this not so discreet napkin tucked into Luis's shirt. That's because the kitchen got extremely hot. I have genuinely never sweated so much in my life. You would have rivers running down your face and your back, I remember. But this is one of the things you learn. You cannot stop, you cannot go out. You have to provide for your crewmate, so you have to keep going. In the same way that when you're on a night watch, sometimes you get caught in these little bursts of storm, little bursts of rain. You can't go inside, you have to stay out there, you have to help because you have a responsibility. Another big event we had was when we caught fish. We caught a couple of mahi-mahi and Anna, our skipper, she wouldn't let us get anywhere near the fish, but she filleted them for us and then cooked us a little buffet of ceviche, sushi and fried fish and it was excellent. The other thing I hadn't expected is that when we got the mahi mahi out of the ocean. Look at the color they were. They were this really popping color of yellow or, or lime. I'm not sure what to call it. But then, as soon as we killed the fish, it immediately turned into, you know, the silver white color we usually associate with, with fish. And I had never seen anything like that. It didn't put me off eating the fish, but it did give me a newfound respect for. for for what the fish was giving to us. And the final thing I'll mention is the wildlife we came across. So I remember there was one day where we had a minke whale just going around the, um, the boat for around an hour. And I was so excited and I was so, like I couldn't look away. I didn't even reach for my mobile. So I have no, no records of, of that event. But we did on several occasions get pods of dolphins. And every single time, again, the team would get overexcited. We would rush to the front of the boat and just look at these dolphins jumping all around us. And it was a sight which never stopped being magical. And here you can see a couple of photos which my teammates took um, from, yeah, from the trip. Now, I couldn't possibly leave you without looking to the future. Um, what can all of us do? going forward, because this is a problem which is still very much present. In order to take, to tackle plastic pollution, um, I believe that we need to 
tackle this across four key pillars, four key areas. First of all, on a personal level, we need to be asking, what can we, doing at, what can we be doing at home to avoid the use of plastic? I'm sure you all have a, a lot of ideas about how to refuse, reuse, reduce plastic, but if you want some more practical tips, and here I emphasize that they are reasonable practical tips, something all of us can do. I would greatly encourage you to read How to Give Up Plastic by Will McCallum, and it's a good book for all ages, so not just the grown-ups. The second thing is education. Who can you talk to about this? Can you talk to your kids, your family, your friends, your colleagues? Because an informed society, an educated society, is a society which can find a solution. Like education is going to be our biggest weapon against plastic waste. The other thing is, the other pillar is industry. So who can you write to? Which businesses can you write to, to talk to them about this problem? Because the reality is that oftentimes, we are buying plastic because we do not have decent alternatives. So we need these industries to do better by us. And by writing, I don't necessarily mean writing a formal letter. Nowadays, you can contact them on Facebook, you can go contact them on Instagram, write them an email. It can be any form of way you want. And the final pillar would be government. So how can you impact policy making? Do you work in government? Can you write a letter to your MP, to your council? to the bigger government, um, the wider government, na the national one, yeah. <laughs> um, and the latter, this one, is becoming especially important nowadays. I mean, government haven't had as much control on our societies in ages. I mean, the state suddenly has an enhanced role. So as we start thinking about transitioning out of COVID, if the government chooses to prioritize environmental issues, plastic pollution, the climate emergency, then something can be done. Then we might be able to turn the tide. Because this is not just something to focus on in the good times, when the going is good as a little side project. This is fundamental um, to, to our future, to having a thriving, successful future. We need to be acting on this now. We've got this very limited window of opportunity, which we need to make sure uh, that we take full advantage of. This is a quote which I came across this week in an article by On The Guardian. It was made by a couple of scientists. They were in, involved in uh, an intergovernmental board. Uh, there was some massive study which came out last year. I don't have the full name, but can look it up. But what they were saying is that Again, as we start thinking about transitioning out of lockdown, it may be politically expedient to relax environmental standards and to prop up industries um, such as fossil fuels, such as airlines, but doing so without requiring urgent and fundamental change essentially sets us up for future pandemics. Because what we need to keep in mind is that there's no such thing as the health of the environment and the health of wildlife and the health of humankind. There is one health. This is all interconnected. Now, when I talk about reusing, refusing plastic, really, this is much of a this is part of a much bigger picture, um, the circular economy model, which presents an alternate model to our current linear model where you're buying, using, and disposing. And it presents a really bright future, mind you, one where we are thriving, not just one where we are just about surviving the impact of plastic pollution and climate change. I'm not going to go into this now beyond saying that there are three key elements to this very complicated diagram explaining the circular economy. This is what it basically boils down to. We need to eliminate plastic we don't need, so we need to refuse plastic we don't need. For the plastic we do actually need, we need to design it in such a way that it can be safely reused, recycled, or composted. So for example, we need much better, better legislation around degradable plastic and around standardization, around how long does it take to decompose, for example. 
And the final thing is that we need to circulate plastic so that it stays in the economy and does not become waste. So for example, when one way to think about it is we need to design our products to be better. So if, for example, your washing machine breaks down, we need to design it in such a way that it makes economical and financial sense for the family to um, fix it rather than disposing and buying a new one. We need to design things in these new innovative ways. I'm going to leave it there for now. Thank you very much for your time. Um, and I'll pass over to Amy. If anyone has any questions, they can feel free to ask them now and they can questions about anything, mind you, life on board, the science, whatever, or else feel free to get in touch later. So I'll stop the presentation.